historically, human beings have proven to be really bad at predicting the future. Pretty bad. Like, if you're in the technology world, or if you're into sci-fi, you would have remembered many, many years ago when people would say, this is what the world is going to look like in 2020, 2030, 2040, and it's all this really weird stuff. Every now and then you have these cool new inventions, and you're like, hey, it's sort of like those old movies we watch. It's actually coming true, but by and large, we're actually really bad at foretelling the future. Uh, I'll give you some examples. Um, back in 1926, there was an inventor. He invented lots of things, and his name was Lee DeForest. And he said, quote, theoretically, television may be feasible, but I consider it an impossibility, a development which we should waste little time dreaming about. Or in 1943, Thomas J. Watson, not the Puritan Thomas Watson, chairman of the board of IBM said, I think there is a world market for about five computers. Five computers. That's what he genuinely believed with the information that was available to him at that time. Or how about this so-called recording company? Let's go into the world of music now. This recording company expert who is quoted saying in 1962, and he was re respected in the record industry, 1962, we don't think the Beatles will do anything in the market. Guitar groups are on their way out. That was 1962, and they were pretty wrong. <clears throat> so human beings are pretty bad at this, uh, unless, of course, you are a true prophet from God. God knows what the future holds. He knows it without exception. He knows it because he has ordained the end from the beginning. He gave us the scriptures. In particular, he gave us the Old Testament. And not only does it predict things about Jesus Christ, the Old Testament scriptures testify about and proclaim Jesus Christ. This is precisely what Jesus declares in John chapter 5, verses 39 to 47. To take you back into the context of this chapter, Jesus has healed the sick man, sick for 38 years, healed him on the Sabbath. The religious leaders start to go against him. They say that what he's done is wrong, healing on the Sabbath, so on and so forth. Jesus says, my father is working today and therefore I am working. I have come to do the will of my Father, he has already said. And the religious leaders pick up on what he is saying and say, this guy is claiming to be equal to God. He's calling God his Father. And they were right. He absolutely did claim to be equal with God, for Jesus is God in the flesh. So what does Jesus do when these accusations come against him? Accusations of blasphemy, punishable by death. By the way, Jesus presents witnesses. He presents the witness of John the Baptist, who many of the Jews knew was a prophet from God. And what did John the Baptist do? He testified of Jesus. He was an eyewitness testimony. He pointed to him and said, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And remember, we asked ourselves last week, when we read the Bible, are we convinced that we are reading the true story of the real world as we know it? Jesus brought the evidence of his miracles. You don't believe what I'm saying? You've seen my miracles, he says. So when you read of Christ's miracles, are you stirred up by the reality of his creative and recreative power? We ought to be, but the Pharisees wouldn't have any of it. And then he invokes the witness of the Father in heaven, God the Father, the, the father who said at Jesus' baptism, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And at the Mount of Transfiguration, he told the people, listen to him. All authority has been given to this son of God. Do you do as God says? Do you listen to the son of God? Do you listen to what Jesus has to say? The Pharisees weren't listening. And now Jesus explains to us why they weren't listening because they were not interested in the glory which comes from God. 
They gloried in themselves. You see, to come to the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Savior of sinners, and to believe that it is His finished work alone that saves us, and that there is no merit in us, no good deeds, no good works that we can do to even contribute in the tiniest way to our salvation, clearly no glory belongs to us in that gospel, in that good news. Now, if you want to have some human merit, if you want to bask in your own piety, in your own performance, that gospel is the last thing you want because it gives glory only to God and none to you. That was the problem of these religious leaders. <clears throat> now, when it comes to John the Baptist, the miracles of Jesus, the Father in heaven, now, they saw the Baptist, they witnessed the miracles, they claim to believe in the Father of Heaven, but for us, especially for us, it goes without saying that all of this evidence is contained where? It's contained in the Scriptures. It's contained in the Bible. In the Scriptures, that's where we read about John the Baptist's testimony. That's where we read about the accounts of Jesus' miracles. That's where we read about the Father's declarations about who Jesus is. This is why Jesus says to the unbelieving Jewish leaders in verses 39 and 40, you search the Scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. It is good to search the Scriptures. You ought to search the Scriptures. But if we are not seeing what the Scriptures plainly show us, there's nothing wrong with the Scriptures. There's something wrong with us. And that's precisely the issue with the Pharisees. They were blind. And they were willingly blinding themselves to the truth. Intellectually, they could potentially see that Jesus is spoken of in the Old Testament. They understand all the promises and, fair, and, and uh, prophecies. But spiritually, they denied it. They denied that all of that was pointing to Jesus Christ, even though it was so clear. They denied Christ in the Scriptures. We can find life, but that life is Christ. And they didn't want Christ. And therefore, really, they didn't want life. And Jesus reveals why in verse 41. He says, I do not receive glory from people, but I know that you do not have the love of God within you. Now, we'll get to the points in the sermon very shortly that's written in your liturgy, but I, I wanted us to see the background to, this, uh, to the, the, what's the surrounding context of what Jesus is saying here. I, I'm not here to receive glory from people. But I want you to know, I know you do not have the love of God within you. A theologian from a while back, Heinrich Bullinger, writes comments about these verses. By all those statements, and he's paraphrasing Jesus here, he's saying, this is what Jesus is saying. By all those statements with which I prove that I am the Son of God, equal to the Father in every respect, I am not seeking that you may suppose human glory and praise. I am not hunting for popular favor which motivates ambitious persons of this world. But above all else, I am seeking the glory of God the Father and the safety of all of you. Bullinger continues about Jesus' rebuke that they don't have the love of God. He's, he writes, Why do I tell a story to the deaf? Hmm. Why do I offer peace and salvation to rebels? Because I certainly see myself to be wasting time and effort. For I perceive that there is no love of God in you. There is no fear of God, no faith, no religion, or eagerness for piety. From your deeds, I conclude this. Those who love God, believe in Him, and obey Him. Those who love the Father are not able to have hated his dearly beloved son. Closed quote. Did you hear that? Those who love the Father would not be able to hate his dearly beloved 
Son. And thus Jesus concludes that these people do not have the love of God and they have no love for the Father in heaven whom they claim to serve. For they deny His own Son. And he continues, Jesus, in verse 43, I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you'll receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? He's saying, you guys don't desire the glory of God. You want to glorify yourselves. You elevate your own efforts, your own piety, your own rules and traditions. You love your echo chambers where you just listen to each other all the time. You stroke each other's egos. You want to impress other legalistic Pharisees. You don't care if an actual godly man approves of you. You want to just impress your peers, the other legalists. You memorize Old Testament scripture but you don't really believe what it says, because if you did, you'd believe in me, says Jesus. His rebuke is scathing. And this would only make sense, this rebuke would only make sense if the Old Testament really did so clearly testify about him, right? This would not be a good argument if the Old Testament was actually difficult to understand, hard to read, unclear, the witness is not in front, uh, uh, right in front of your face, it would make no sense for Jesus to rebuke them so scathingly. So does the Old Testament really so clearly testify about Jesus Christ? That's what brings us to our first point, the inspired witness of Scripture. Now we're going to do a bit of a whole Bible study for the next 20 minutes. And we're going to look at how the Old Testament, some ways that the Old Testament testifies about Jesus Christ. First of all, understand that Scripture is the Word of God. 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture is breathed out by God. What was Scripture at the time that Paul wrote those words? That's right, the New Testament was still being written. So primarily he is referring in that historical context to the scriptures they had, the Old Testament. The Old Testament is inspired. All the Bible's inspired, but don't make a mistake on this. The Old Testament is just as inspired as the New Testament. It's all the Word of God. Jesus addressed the Jews in our passage in John 5 and said to them, that the very scriptures which they claim to believe, that is, the books of the Old Testament which we continue to hold today as Christians, testify about Him. Is the Old Testament really about Jesus? Flip over to Luke chapter 24, please. Now, in verse 13 onwards in Luke chapter 24, we have the account of Jesus meeting those disciples on the road to Emmaus. Remember, they didn't recognize him? Jump down to verse 28. <clears throat> so they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going, he were, it, he acted as if he were going farther, but they urged him strongly saying, stay with us. For it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them, and their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And he vanished from their sight. Now they said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us? while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures. And they arose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven, the apostles, and those who were with them gathered, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road 
and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. Pause there. Here's Jesus explaining the scriptures, the, the, the scriptures of the Old Testament to his disciples, and then come down to verse 44. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written. Hear that? Thus it is written. What? That the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. And that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power on high. According to Jesus, it is in the Old Testament that he would suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that the gospel would be proclaimed. According to Jesus in John chapter 5, the scriptures testify about him. The question is exactly how. I want to give you three ways that the Old Testament testifies about Jesus Christ. This is by no means exhaustive. We could spend many, many sermons on this, but we'll do what we can with the time that we have today. First of all, it's testimony of promises. Promises. The Old Testament promises Christ. And where do we see the first promise of Christ? We read it earlier. Where? Genesis chapter 3. The first mention of the gospel. Genesis chapter 3, in verse 15, here's the first mention. God says to the serpent, God preaches the gospel to the enemy. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. You, in other words, you will wound this offspring, but he will deal to you a fatal blow. This is the promise of the serpent crusher. So from there, we might wonder, is he coming? Is he coming? Who's going to crush the serpent? Adam failed to crush the serpent. He let the serpent come in to deceive Eve. He followed his wife's sinful advice, and he sinned against God. The world is now tainted with sin. Where's the serpent crusher? Who is going to defeat sin and death and Satan himself? Well, it doesn't really happen anytime soon. The curse of sin is death, for the wages of sin is death. And in Genesis chapter 5, we get... This is the book of the generations of Adam. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. Male and female, he created them. All of this good stuff. And then, afterwards, all the descendants. And then he died. And then died. And then the next descendant died. And then the next descendant died. And then his son died. And his son died. The world is cursed. Humanity is cursed. There is decay. There is death. Where is the serpent crusher? Well, you see the great flood, a judgment against sin. God promises to preserve the world. Then in Genesis 12, go there with me, God sets apart one man from whom a mighty nation would arise. Genesis 12, verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and, in him, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and listen to this, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And then from there you have all this talk about your offspring. I will give it to your offspring. I have promised it to your offspring. It will be inherited by your offspring. All of that stuff. Who's going to bless the nations? Who's going to arise out of Abraham, out of the loins of Abraham, out of Israel, that all the nations would be blessed? 
Well, the serpent crusher is one who indeed would bless all the nations, wouldn't he, if he was to reverse the curse of sin. And then let's skip forward and we finally get to the heyday of Israel, the days of King David, the days of King Solomon, so rich, powerful nation with much splendor. And there's so many passages we can look to for the promise of the Davidic king, but I, I wanted us to look at Jeremiah 23. Go there with me. Jeremiah 23, verses 5 and 6. Go there. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell securely and this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. Many years pass. Where in the world is this righteous king? Where's the serpent crusher? Where's the seed of Abraham who will bless the nations? Where's the son of David who will reign and rule forever? We get a few hundred years of silence, no prophets. Then the first book of the New Testament, Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. What do we read there? Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. It's one verse loaded with biblical theology. I actually want us to read it together. Matthew 1 verse 1, read. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. There's so much in there. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ mirrors what we read in Genesis 5, the genealogy of Adam and his descendants. Jesus is the new Adam. He is the last Adam. He's come to reverse the curse. He is the serpent crusher. He is the son of David. He is the son of Abraham. He is the promised Messiah. Don't believe me? The rest of the New Testament confirms that we're not reading something that's not in this text into this text. Romans 16, 20, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. That's Jesus. He crushes Satan under his feet. He is the promised serpent crusher. How about in Acts 13, verses 22 to 23, and when he had removed him, God raised up David to be their king, of whom he testified and said, I have found in David the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who will do all my will. Of this man's offspring, God has brought to Israel a Savior, Jesus, as he promised. He is the Messiah, the promised Davidic king. And then, of course, Luke has been touching on this sometimes in the evenings. Galatians 3, verse 16. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. Jesus is so clearly promised in the Old Testament. You, you don't need to read Jesus Christ is coming throughout the Old Testament. It is essentially screaming that He is coming, so much so that when a name is put to the face, His name is Jesus Christ, you can do nothing but say, that's the one. That's the one that was promised. That's the one that was declared who would arrive, who would crush the serpent, who would bless the nations, who would rule from the throne of David forever. Now, very closely related to promise is Scripture's testimony of prophecy. That's the second. Prophecy. And I, <clears throat> I don't think you need much persuading at this point. I mean, many of those promises are prophetic. 
So we go from the general concept of God promising a Savior, we then get specific prophecies about that Savior, about Jesus. Prophecy after prophecy. We find out He will be called Emmanuel, God with us. And He would be born of a virgin, Isaiah 7.14. We discover that he is the king who would be born in Bethlehem, Micah 5.2. I personally, and there's definitely more, counted over 20 prophecies that were fulfilled just on the day of Jesus' crucifixion. There's plenty more. I'm not going to name all of them, but I'll give you some examples of what I see. Judas' betrayal, the disciples fleeing from Jesus, the Passover lamb slaughtered, the suffering servant, dying for his people, his body being disfigured, his being condemned as a criminal, his being silent at his trial, his hands and feet pierced, his garments divided, and we can keep on going. Prophecy after prophecy fulfilled in Jesus Christ. All of it spoken of in the Old Testament, often with meticulous detail. In Jesus, we find the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. That brings us to the third example of how the Old Testament testifies about Jesus. It's testimony of types and shadows. We like this. If you want a third letter P, you know, you've got promise, prophecy, you can say prefiguration. That's a real word. It's a real word. Prefiguration. Jesus is prefigured through types and shadows. What is a type? We talk about it a lot. I'll talk about it again. In the New Testament, the word type, the Greek word tupos, is used 15 times. It speaks of an impression, an image, an example, or a pattern. For example, Adam is called a type of Christ. One of our favorite authors, Mitchell Chase, who wrote the, the book, 40 Questions about Biblical Typology and Allegory, defines a type or typology as this. A biblical type is a person, office, place, institution, event, or thing in salvation history that anticipates, shares correspondence with, escalates toward, and resolves in its antitype. Adam is a type of Christ. Jesus is the greater Adam. He is the fulfillment of what Adam was always supposed to be. You see, God works in history. He didn't give us the Bible all at once. He used history to advance His redemptive purposes progressively. The Old Testament, therefore, is filled with types and shadows which the New Testament later picks up on. The Old Covenant is designed to be preparatory for the coming of Christ. It is, to use a technical word, typological by nature. Like the Apostle Paul. He lists several events in Israel's life in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. He calls them types, examples for us. Those events were purposefully typological, like going through the wilderness and the pillar of fire and all of that stuff, not only as examples for us, but they point us to Christ. 1 Corinthians 10.4, For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. So many types. You often think of people, but at this, in this instance, it's even a rock. I mean, a rock. Some ro a rock in the Old Testament was a type of Christ. And you tell me the Old Testament is not about Christ. It's about Christ. Even the rock is about Christ over here. This is why Hebrews can speak of the Old Covenant as a shadow of the good things to come, Hebrews 10.1. In furthering this argument, Hebrews points out how in the Old Covenant, the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year can't perfect anyone. The sacrifices are a type of Christ. The offerings are a type of Christ. The entire Old Covenant Levitical system is a type of Christ. The, pe the, the priests are a type of Christ. 
It's all contrasted with Christ, our once and for all sacrifice who laid down his life on the cross and who is our sinless, eternal, great high priest. You don't need priests with fancy collars anymore today. They're not priests of God. Christ is the great high priest. He has created a priesthood of believers. To use our little definition from our friend Mitch, the old covenant and its sacrifices and its institutions anticipates, shares correspondence with, escalates toward, and resolves in its antitype, which is Christ and his new covenant. The old covenant, in and of itself, could not save, for it was never meant to. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins, Hebrews 10.4. Only Christ's blood, the fulfillment of all that old blood, Christ's blood of the new covenant alone can redeem sinners. So there you have it. The Old Testament so clearly testifies about Christ through promises, prophecies, prefiguration in types and shadows. The Old Testament definitely proclaims Christ in way more ways than this, but this is all that we have time for. So we need to move to our second point now. If indeed we have the inspired witness of Scripture and Scripture authoritatively and ever so clearly testifies about Christ, what's going to happen if we reject its testimony? Well, you see, the Old Testament is infallible. Our second point is the infallibility of the Old Testament. When we speak of something being infallible, we mean that it's incapable of making mistakes, it's never failing, and it is always effective in accomplishing what God designed it for. If God designed the Old Testament to testify of Christ, and you are not seeing Christ there, it's not a failure of the Old Testament, it's our own failure. Isaiah 55, 10 to 11 says, for as the rain and the snow come from heaven, come down from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. God's word is never ineffective. It is effective to bring God's elect to faith in the Son, Jesus Christ. It is also effective to justly condemn those who reject its testimony. Remember, one of the primary purposes of the Old Testament is to testify about Christ. So, rejecting its testimony means certain condemnation. Certain condemnation. Church, this is how effective God's Word is. It's so clear, it's so pointed, that to turn a blind eye to what it says leads to destruction, leads to condemnation. Let's go back to John chapter 5, if we've not lost ourselves. We read in verse 45, Let's jump back into the conversation that he's having with the Pharisees. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There's one who accuses you. Jesus is not saying he doesn't have authority to accuse them and to judge them. He's basically saying, I don't even need to. You're already accused. Somebody is already accusing you. Who? Moses. On whom you have set your hope. The most direct reference for what Jesus is saying here would be that reference in Deuteronomy, right? Where God says, I will raise up a prophet like you from among your brothers, and when he is raised, listen to him. Listen to him. Listen to him. In whom I am well pleased, says the Father, that's my son. Listen to him. It would have been very clear. Jesus is the ultimate and final prophet, the word from above who speaks authoritatively, for he is God. Moses accuses you, O Pharisees, 
You've set your hope in him, haven't you? Not like the person Moses is going to show up in this conversation and go, hey, you guys are bad. The law, the writings of Moses, there is more than enough in there for us to know the Messiah. Thus, those who reject what Moses has written reject the Savior that, that whom Moses has written about. The Pharisees highly exalted Moses. They appealed to him left and right. They were all about the Mosaic law, but then they missed the whole point of it. May it never be for us, brothers and sisters. If we claim to study the Bible, let's ask God to help us believe everything that it says, especially about Christ. And let's resist the temptation, much like what the Pharisees did, uh, to confuse the law for the gospel and the gospel for the law. Let's not set our hope in Moses or in the law, but in Christ who fulfills the law. Because as Jesus says in verse 46, if you believed Moses, you would believe me. For he wrote of me. What you've got to do is you've got to open up your Bible and you've got to see Christ. Do that. Open up your Bible and see Christ. Seriously, if you have spiritual eyes, if you are a child of God, if you belong to His kingdom, that's what's going to happen when you open up your Bible with a willingness to understand what it says. You open up your Bible, you will see Christ. Not in silly children's pictures, but spiritually. In the realest sense, you will know him, you will see him. That's why God gave us this book. He gave us this book that we might see, believe, know, love, cherish, exalt, worship, adore, embrace, Commune with and enjoy Christ. That's why he gave it to us. Do this in public worship. Do this in private worship. Do this in family worship. Open up your Bible. Ask for the Spirit to illuminate the words of Scripture to you and behold Christ. You'll see him in the promises. You'll see him in the prophecies. You'll see him in the types and shadows. You'll see him in so much more. He's all over the place. You literally can't miss him. But as Jesus says in verse 47, last verse of this chapter, but if you do not believe Moses' writings, if you do not believe his writings, by extension, if you don't believe the Old Testament, if you don't believe the Scriptures, how will you believe my words. How you believe the words of Christ. If you don't really believe what Moses wrote, then you don't believe me, says Jesus. The two are inseparable. So he here's the last thing you need to understand. In regard, even to the Old Testament, believing its testimony means believing Christ. I saw these <clears throat> posts recently. I think, I think it was like, like from some priest's Twitter, some Roman Catholic priest. And it said something like, it's, it's so sad how so many people claim to love Jesus, but they love the Bible more than they love Jesus. You know that? You know that kind of thinking? Oh, it's, it's so sad. You, got, you guys claim to love Jesus so much, but it, honestly, you love the Bible more than you love Jesus. That is a horrible, false dichotomy. Jesus says, you believe this, you believe me. You believe what this says, you believe me. You love this, it is loving me. This is a good thing. That believing its testimony means believing Christ. Oh, you want to believe Christ, okay. You want to believe what he says. I love his teaching. I love what Jesus, where are you going to get that? Where'd you find that? It's in the word of God. 
This is good, assurance-filled news for us Christians that whenever you read the Bible and you believe what it says, you know what you're doing? You're believing your Savior. You're believing Him. You're believing exactly what He is saying. The Word of God is the Word of Christ. Faith comes from hearing, from hearing the Word of Christ, and thus to believe the Word of Christ is to believe Christ. The two are inseparable. The Word is truth, John 17, 17. Jesus is the truth. To believe God's true Word is inevitably to believe His true Son, Jesus. Because what the Word of God does is something very simple. It testifies about Jesus. We, we, we could have just, just focused on that one sentence that Jesus said. That's what this is all about. The Scriptures testify about me. Do you believe in the testimony of Scripture? Jesus has presented evidence to back up his claims that he is the Son of God, that he has come to do the Father's will to save sinners. He went so far as to lay down his life to die on the cross so that anyone who has faith in him, faith in his finished work, could be justified in the eyes of God, declared righteous. He came to the point of even resurrecting from the dead so that we might have resurrection life. Where is all of that contained, that good news? It's in the Word of God. And Jesus' claims is backed up by credible witnesses, by sound evidence. His case is overwhelmingly solid. Do you believe the testimony of the Bible? That Jesus is who He says He is. Because if you believe what the Bible says about Jesus, take heart. You believe Jesus Himself, and you have passed from death to life. No matter what anyone else thinks, God is your witness. This is true. You are alive if you have trusted in what Jesus has given us in His Word. So take this book, Believe in its promises. Follow the trajectory of its prophecies. Take a good, hard look at the types and shadows which point you to Christ. And you will, you will, as Paul says in Ephesians 4.20, learn Christ. Right here, you have a trustworthy witness that testifies about all that Christ is and all that He has done for you. Receive. Receive the Word. Receive Christ. Let's pray.